Hi, me environmental students. Today we're going to be talking about stratospheric ozone. Remember, stratosphere is up in the sky. So let's talk about how, unfortunately, there is some struggling with that part of our atmosphere. So to understand the stratosphere, we really have to understand ozone. And ozone forms through a cycle. So here is the ozone formation cycle. And it is a replenishable resource, meaning it should come back on its own. It is not alive which is why we don't call it renewable. That's why we categorize it as replenishable. So here's how it works. Ozone is O3, meaning there's three molecules of, o, of oxygen. And when it is hit by the sun's UV rays, one of those oxygen molecules, boop, or oxygen atoms, I should say, bounces off and it separates. And so we call that an oxygen radical, or it's all by itself. And then here is our normal breathable oxygen, diatomic, meaning two oxygen atoms together. So UV rays is able to just bring one of those oxygen atoms off and leave the other two together. That's normal. But what's really cool is that radical is so radical, just bouncing around, boom, 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 boom. And once in a while, it smashes back into that O2 that we're normally used to, that's breathing O2 our normal oxygen, and it bounces back together with its other two partners and forms O3 again, ozone. So this can happen over and over again because once again UV lights can, UV rays can hit this and it can separate out again into these two and then form again, hit by UV, separate out, form again, and that's a normal process and actually that's how ozone shields the UV rays from hitting us. So we really appreciate that ozone does this process. It's very helpful. So again, in word form, when UV strikes the O3, it absorbs that energy and it's able to break the chemical bond between one of the oxygen atoms and the other two oxygen atoms, right? So this was what we just described. And so UV then is not able to hit the Earth's surface. Thank goodness, because I don't know about you, but even when I put on some sunscreen, I still worry about those UV rays because we don't want them. They can be cancerous, right? But there's this chemical called chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, that were discovered in the 1930s. All right, so you only have to write it in full form once. And why were these discovered? Well, so there are a lot of benefits to these compounds. They're stable, they're odorless, so they're not super smelly. They're non-flammable, they're non-toxic, and they're non-corrosive. So you might say, okay, that's great, but what were they used for? Well, they were used for really spraying stuff and also cooling things. So they were in refrigerators, refrigerants. They were propellants. They were aerosol hairsprays. So they were sprayed all over the place, fumigants things like bug sprays, production of plastics. So they were used a lot as industrialization and urbanization was kicking into high gear in the 40s and the 50s. So these things were spraying all over the place into the air. Spray, spray, spray. But then suddenly scientists by the 70s started to say, oh my gosh, we think this thing is linked to the ozone hole, which is the stratospheric ozone concentration beginning to decrease. And because of this, we start to freak out. The UNEP and the U.S. included with support nationally start to call for a ban. So they campaign and they campaign and try to get a ban of this stuff because let's look at why it's bad. So CFCs are a mostly known for the chlorine part of the atom. So CFC has three chlorines, kind of like how ozone has three oxygens. And what it does, it, it interacts with light, just like how oxygen in ozone interacts with light. So the problem is one CFC molecule can destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. That's a lot. That's quite bad. One CFC can destroy that many. Imagine what lots of CFC molecules can do. Well, how does this process happen? Well, so CFCs, right, have this chlorine in a set of three, kind of like how oxygen was in a set of three atoms for ozone. And it interacts with UV and one of those chlorines bounces off, just like how there was an oxygen atom that bounced off of uh, ozone. Now, then we have our ozone molecule, and it's going to interact with the chlorine. And that chlorine from before, oops, is going to combine with one of those flying around oxygens. Well, normally we wanted that oxygen to bounce back with its two partners and reform ozone. 
But unfortunately, these guys are stuck together, and they're going to keep it from forming back together. So chlorine is being a bully, which is why I have it colored in red, and it's keeping that radical oxygen from reforming ozone, because we really want this by itself radical oxygen to go with the other two oxygens here and reform ozone. But unfortunately, chlorine just keeps on making it so that those oxygen radicals separate off and never reform ozone. This is terrible. All right, so this is massive, massive destruction to ozone. So remember, naturally ozone will break down when it absorbs UV, but this pollutant enhances the O3 destruction and it disturbs equilibrium. So does this seem like stable or unstable equilibrium? I hope you said unstable. So what type of feedback loop is that? It is a positive feedback loop because it's going further and further away from equilibrium. The more CFCs we have, the more chlorine atoms stealing those O atoms away from reforming ozone. Yikes! And then we have less and less ozone in the ozone layer in the stratosphere. Oh no! What is the problem with this? Well, then we start having UV rays coming down where we are. So more UV rays is going to impact human health. We have worse sunburns, more eye cataracts, more skin cancer, our immune systems get suppressed. Oh, terrible. It can affect our food and forests, so we're going to have less crop yield. We're going to have less seafood supplies because the phytoplankton at the bottom of the food chain are going to affect how much big fish are going to form. We're going to have very sensitive trees and they get these sunspots, which are really mean they're not healthy and then they're not going to grow as much. And if they don't grow as much, they're going to do less photosynthesis. It's going to affect wildlife just like us affecting our eyes. They get cataracts and cataracts are these big blocks on your eyes. They're going to decrease again those aquatic populations. And again, they're going to mess up food chains and food webs. Very bad. We don't want that extra UV. We want that ozone layer to protect us like a big umbrella. And overall, if I have more UV, I'm going to have more air pollution. We're going to learn later in our unit that if I have more sunlight coming down, it's going to create more chemical smog. And that's going to be really bad for our plastics, our indoor paint. It's going to make toxic chemicals more in where we breathe. We don't want all that light coming down. It's too much. So what can we do about it? And what have we done about it? What are those pollution management strategies? So remember, we think about it in that three point model. So for replace, we can replace the sprays and, and coolants. So make sure they have no CFCs. But this was really hard initially without bans or fines. So remember the UNEP and governments wanted to actually have a formal ban. We could have campaigns and education. Remember the EPA and the Clean Air Act and the UNEP, they really are working hard to get people to agree after they campaign and they campaign. But eventually we get a formal regulation. It's an international regulation and you have to have to know it. So this is a really important term for us. The Montreal Protocol, it initially only had about 24 countries ratify it. But by the 2000s, it started to reduce CFCs because it banned them by 30%. And now there are 197 countries that have ratified the Montreal Protocol. So this is a really successful global international agreement and not all international agreements are so successful unfortunately even though cfcs have started to decrease and they're banned they have this weird cousin called hcfc and those are now a really bad greenhouse gas so this was the new replacement and it's actually really bad almost worse but that's another story entirely Unfortunately, there's not a really good technology for adding ozone back into the stratosphere. So to have our ozone hole begin to replenish, we really have to fix by replacing or regulating because after the fact, it's not really working so well.